Welcome to our video model of how to create single case design graphs using GraphPad Prism 7. If you haven't already done so, please open the data table file in Prism and click on the clinic graph that's listed under the graphs folder. I've also opened the mock graph Prism exemplar file, uh, the PDF file that's included with the video model. And this shows us the graph that we'll be creating today in Prism. And then I also have the raw data files and the session log on the left hand side of my screen ready to use for information such as phase labels and the legend. So the first thing you want to do in PRISM is go over to this new window, change graph type, and make sure that you've selected X and Y that will allow us to create a graph like the model graph. And we'll click the second icon here which is points and connecting line and then click OK. All right, the first thing that we're going to do is if you hover, hover over any one of these data points and double click it, it'll open this uh, format graph window. So I'm going to pull this over to the left side of my screen so we can see all the changes take place on the right side of the screen on the actual graph. So there are three different uh, dependent measures on this graph. There's self-injurious behavior, SIB, PICA, and item engagement. If you look at the actual raw data files from BData Pro that are part of this video model, double click any one of these Excel files. I'm gonna pull this back over to the left hand side of my screen. You'll see that there are the three dependent measures listed in BData Pro. If you use any of the files that are included for the video model, the first and second uh, dependent measures will always be the black and white scatter and line plot data respectively, whereas the third dependent measure will always be the uh, gray bars that are plotted on the secondary y-axis. So for some of the files that you'll see um, for other target graphs, it might be additional frequency keys as key number three, or it'll be listed under duration. So the reason we want to know this is to figure out where to plot our data. Do we need it on the primary y-axis or the secondary y-axis? So if you go back to Prism in the Format Graph tab, first we're going to click this drop-down menu for data set and go to our first SIB or self injurious behavior uh, data path here. So baseline SIB. First, we mm -hmm. want to make sure that the symbols that we're trying to create are the ones that are listed for uh, this data path. And it looks like, yes, it's black mm -hmm. circles with lines and it's sourced to the left y axis. Next, we're going to click down and go to competing items SIB. You can see here it's listed as closed triangles, where it should be closed circles. So you'll click shape, select the black circle, and then we'll click apply. So one thing you'll notice on our graph is that there are uh, multiple legend items for the same target uh, variable. So what we'll do is uh, for competing items SIB, We'll deselect show legend and click apply and you'll notice it'll remove that additional legend entry for the second SIB um, data path. Now let's go to baseline pica and you'll see this should be white circles so we'll click shape, we'll select the open circle and you'll notice that uh, for color it shows transparency. Uh, the reason that could be problematic is if we uh, made these circles transparent for this phase here where there are gray bars uh, these data points would show up as gray so we'll click color and we'll select A1 or white. Again we want it on the left y-axis and we can keep it on the legend for now. So we'll click apply. Now let's, let's select data set again and we'll go to competing items pica. So again, we'll change the shape to circles that are white. And it's on the left y-axis, but we don't need it in the legend because we already have 
baseline pick on there. So we'll deselect show legend and click apply. The final dependent measure is item engagement, which again is the third key on here. It's one of the duration keys. And it's listed as a gray bar that's sourced to the secondary y-axis. So to create a bar graph, um, and you can see over here it's uh, scatter and line plot right now. We'll deselect show symbols and sh show connecting line and curve. And instead we'll select show bars slash spikes slash drop lines. And we'll create the color. We can select B1 or C1, whatever your preference is for how gray you want the bar. And then uh, I like the bars a little thicker, like on this target graph, so we'll, we'll go to width and select 7. And to save some black ink, we'll click uh, border color, and again select the same color as the initial color. So that'll take away the black border that might use up extra ink that we don't necessarily need. The last thing that we want to do is make sure we click plot on the right y-axis because we want it sourced to percentage of item engagement here. And we could keep show legend checked because there's only one data path for item engagement. So we'll click apply. So the graph doesn't look exactly like the model graph does, but we'll get there. So now we can click OK to close this window. What we'll do is we'll come back over to the graph and we'll start adjusting the axes. So the reason that we edited the appearance of the um, different data paths first and source them to the appropriate axis is that Prism will automatically change the range of the axes to fit your data. So um, you can see it changed it to zero to six for uh, our two dependent measures that are sourced to the primary axis and 0 to 100 for the bar graphs just as we want them to be. So let's double click one of these axes. We'll select the y-axis here. And I'm going to move this all the way over again to the left side of my screen. So this is the format axes uh, window and there are multiple tabs on here. I'm just going to click the first tab which is frame and origin. And you can see that the graph is kind of squished right now and pretty small. So what we're going to do is change the size first. So if you go to the second header here, this is shape, size, and position, and you click size, there are some of these preset options. We're going to select custom, the last one. And I like a width of 6 inches by a height of 2 inches. We'll click apply. And so you can see now this is looking more like the graph that we created uh, for the model. Next what we'll do is we want some of these zero points to float um, off of this x-axis so that the data points aren't directly on the x-axis. So there are a couple ways of doing this. You could adjust the y-axis so that, uh, just like in Microsoft Excel, you could put a negative value so that the data points flip, uh, float. But for our purposes, perhaps the easiest option is to go to Frame Style, click on Offset X and Y axes. And here you can see it creates that little gap like we have on our graph, and you can click Apply. Next, what we'll do is start formatting our different axes. We'll click on the x-axis tab, and we'll deselect automatically determine the range and the interval. If we want to make sure that we're encompassing the minimum and maximum range of our data, we can open the session log file that's included with the video model. And what I like to do for my data is just look at each of the uh, panels here to make sure that I know what the final session number was. So it looks like for all of these it's session 15. So the other thing we'll do is we'll change the minimum. So there is no session 0. We don't want this 0 here um, on our graph. So we'll change the minimum to session 1. Alright. So the other thing we can do is adjust these tick intervals. And so I like to have at least 
three ticks on each of my axes. Uh, you can see on the model graph here, uh, it goes by twos, so we get input two. Um, but again, you could play around with it uh, for different graphs. For example, if it goes from session uh, one to 15, you might do tick intervals of five. So we'll click apply here, and you can see this takes effect uh, for our axis. But one thing you'll notice on our multiple baseline graph is that only the third panel has the tick labels underneath. So what we'll do is we'll go to all ticks, location of numbering and labeling, click this drop down menu, and we'll select none and click apply. And you can see now we've lost those uh, tick labels so that we only have them on the bottom panel, just reducing again the amount of ink on our graph. Next, we'll select left y-axis, or primary y-axis. Again, we will deselect automatically determine the range and interval. And if the interval is set up the way you want it, like 0 to 6, that's great. You can keep this the same. But if you wanted to adjust it a little bit, uh, here's where you could change the minimum and maximum. So, for example, Sometimes if uh, your data points are at the very top or the very bottom of your graph, uh, the thickness of the line uh, is a little bit thinner if it's falling right at the top of your x-axis. So for example, if this was 0 to 100 and we had a bunch of data points at 100%, the line would be a lot thinner um, at the top of our graph. So here's where you might change this to perhaps negative 0.2 to 100.2 if you see that um, issue arising. And again, you could change the major tick intervals here and click apply. So again, for the purpose of this graph, we will keep all the default values the same uh, because we want intervals of two and zero to six as our uh, minimum to maximum. Now we'll click right y-axis. Again, you can deselect automatically determine the range and interval. And we'll keep uh, what PRISM has created here, which is 0 to 100, and a major tick interval of 20. But again, depending on what you're graphing, you might just want to double check what PRISM has entered for you. Because sometimes it gives you uh, pretty large major tick intervals, or sometimes the range is a little funky. So. If you are doing a percentage, you probably want 0 to 100 as opposed to 20 to 60 percent as your range um, if most of your data fall within that range. All right, now let's click Titles and Fonts. And what we're going to do is deselect all of these checked boxes and click Apply. What that does is remove the graph title and different axis labels because if you look at our mock graph, uh, we have the titles in the corner here, which we'll input later when we create this layout. And then we have a single uh, primary, secondary, y-axis, and x-axis label um, when we have our multiple baseline design, so we don't need it on the individual panel. So now we'll click OK and go back to our graph. So it's shaping up to the graph that we're trying to create here, but you can notice that there's a pretty large gap here where the data are floating pretty far off the x-axis. So if you click and drag on the y-axis, you can pull the data down and just play around with this until your scatter and line plot data are just hovering over the x-axis and not falling on the x-axis. You can click on the y-axis and again pull this down for vertical bar charts um, it looks a little strange when the zero points are floating here, so I'm actually going to pull this all the way down where most of these bars touch the x-axis. The other thing you can do is pull this um, x-axis a bit so that your data points uh, come a little bit closer to the y-axis, but still having um, a little bit of space there so that they're not falling on the y-axis. All right, the graph is looking pretty similar to our mock graph, except for the legend. So what I'm going to do is uh, just hit the control key on my keyboard, 
and click each one of these uh, legend labels. And then I'm going to click and, and move these down just so I can edit these down here. So if you look at the legend, uh, we have self injurious behavior, pica, and item engagement. If you're not working from our model graph and are using BData Pro, again, you can look at your uh, BData Pro Excel output and look at how the keys are labeled here for how you should uh, label the different dependent measures on your graph. So we can remove the condition name from here so that it's just SIB or self injurious behavior. We'll write that out here. We'll remove PICA and item engagement looks good. So now we want the rectangle that goes uh, behind the legend. So we'll draw a rectangle here and then we'll double click and we will add fill uh, because we want a white rectangle that goes uh, on top of the gray bars here. So if you go to interior fill, you could select A1 for white and click OK. Now what you could do is again, you can hold control and select these or now that they're off the graph, you can click down your uh, mouse and select all of them. And then we'll right click and send to front. And the reason we do that is because if you then click and hold and move this over to your box, uh, the text comes on top of the box and the box is not on top of the text. And then again, you can play around with your rectangle so that it encompasses all of your text. The last thing we'll do is to make this a unified uh, legend here is if you uh, again, click your mouse button down and select everything. You can then right click and select group or you could use the hotkey control G. And now this is a unified legend that you can move anywhere. And we'll put this up in our graph. Uh, so we want this in the graph, not outside the graph because it'll throw off the size of our other graphs when we put this in a multiple baseline. Um, and you'll just want to make sure that this is in some place that doesn't obscure so much of the data and is not covering any of your data. So we'll put this in the top right hand corner. So here comes the fun part. We've created our first graph to our specifications and now it's really easy to make the second and third graph panels. So what we'll do is we'll click home again x, y and we'll select the second points and connecting line and click OK. What we'll do is we'll select all of our legend on here because we only need one legend. And we'll just click delete to remove that legend. Now we'll go to the third graph, school. Again, X, Y, points and connecting line. We'll click OK. We'll select this legend and delete it. Now what we could do is if you hold down your control key uh, when you're selected on either home or school and select the other one, you'll notice that now Prism selected those two other panels that we have not yet created. What we could do now is click this little magic wand button up on the toolbar under change. What's really nice about Prism is that with this button we can make these graphs look identical to the graph that we just spent a lot of time uh, creating to our specifications. So I'm going to pull this over here and just show what this looks like. So um, on Prism it'll give you different graphs to select um, to serve as your template. Uh, for us we'll select clinic but as you create more and more graphs in Prism it'll also give you uh, graphs from various files which is pretty nice if you're creating a new graph um, and don't have one of your templated graphs uh, included in your existing file. So now we'll make sure we select the clinic and click next. And you can see it makes the second and third panel look just like the first one. And you can adjust all these different properties uh, accordingly if you wanted 
certain things to be consistent and certain things to be different. So if you're comfortable with this, you could click OK. And you can see it changed the graph. So you can double click on either one of these. I'm going to select Home, and it takes you to that graph. If for some reason Prism keeps putting the graph in an inconvenient location for you, what you can do is go up to Arrange, and there's this button called Center Everything on the Page, and that puts it in the central location on the page, so it's a little easier to find. So I'm just going to do that for each of these graphs as we work on them. All right, so another thing that Prism does uh, a lot easier than uh, something like Microsoft Excel is multiple baseline design graphs. So what we'll do now is we'll click this little layouts folder and here's what allows us to organize our single graph panels into one layout page. And so you can change the background color, the orientation of the page, um, how the layout looks. Um, for what we're doing, we'll keep it portrait, and we'll select this uh, fourth option on the top row, which you can see it's three graph panels in a row. And then you can have the option to have just placeholders where you can click and drag and drop the graph panels into your layout, which is nice if you're still trying to figure out which graphs you want on there. But for our purposes, we'll select this fill the layout with graphs option. And we'll just make sure that we start with clinic and it's in the order that we want. So clinic, home, and school, that looks good. We'll click OK. So now you can see that uh, all the graphs are on here in the order that we want. What we want to do first is uh, draw in these multiple baseline lines. So the way we could do that is if we go to the draw tool, click uh, on the arrow, and select this little elbow line. I'm going to zoom in here. And what you'll want to do is just get to the position that you want in between uh, where the phase will be, the phase change. And you'll click and then just drag. And you can move over to the right um, for your connecting line here. So this looks pretty good. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, hit Control C. You could also right click and copy. And then I'm going to hit Control V, which pastes, or you can right click and paste. And in that way, I already have a similar looking uh, phase line here. But I'm going to pull this down about halfway in between these phases. And so we don't want to paste another one of these lines with the elbow. We want a straight vertical line. So go up to draw, select the down arrow, and select the first option, which is draw a line. What's also nice about Prism is that if you hold down the shift key when you draw something, it'll straighten the line out. So I'm going to click here, hold down shift, and pull my line down to the axis. That looks pretty good, but I think there's some spaces there. So I'm going to just adjust this. If you need to adjust it, you can uh, move it around with your arrow buttons on your keyboard and also uh, adjust it with your mouse. All right, that looks pretty good. So we will zoom out again. So one thing that uh, you'll notice that's missing is uh, the x-axis labels on the third panel. So what we'll do before we add in the x-axis label for sessions is we'll click on the school graph. We'll double click the x-axis. And instead of location of numbering and labeling none, we'll click down and put below and horizontal and click apply. Now you can see those axis numbers are there, and if we click back on our layout, they're on our third panel, just like in our model graph. All right, let's add the uh, x-axis label first. So for any of the um, 
graphs that you create for a video model that are included with this tutorial. Um, the x-axis will always be sessions, but again, um, you might change that to session or trials or days, whatever your um, x-axis measurement is. So we'll click this text box here. We'll go down here and type in sessions. Um, I prefer all caps, so that's what I'm going to do is have it all capitalized. And it looks like it's pretty much centered, but if you move it around, Prism will show you what uh, the center of the page is, which is pretty nice. And you'll see that dotted line there, so I'm going to let go. And now what I'll do is I'll click here. I will copy and paste. You can either hit Control C and then Control V, or you can uh, so that's centered. And now let's increase the size a little bit. It looks like it's about size 24. And we'll just pull this a little bit so that uh, it's all on one line. Let's make sure that's centered. So now what I'm going to do for um, the primary and secondary uh, axis labels is I'm just going to click on our x-axis label, hit Control c and then Control v to paste, or you can right-click um, and copy and paste. Stick that up there. And then I'm going to do the same thing stick this over here. Now what I'm going to do is click on one of these, the one that's the primary y-axis. I'll right click, go to rotation, and we'll do vertical up to make the font face this way. You can also use these rotation uh, buttons up at the top. Click on the other one, right click rotation, and we'll do down. This is a preference thing. I like the font facing this way. Uh, some people prefer to keep the same orientation even for the secondary y-axis here. So you can do what you prefer. So now we have to figure out what our primary and secondary axis labels should be. So looking at our model graph, we have responses per minute and percentage of item engagement. But if you're using some of the other uh, data input and graph files included with our video models. Um, what you can do is, again, look at your B Data Pro file, and you can see what each one of these dependent measures is. And so if it says RPM, that means responses per minute, or it might be listed as percentage of intervals, or percentage of total time, or just time. And so you'll just want to make sure that you're putting in the accurate um, label for what your dependent measure is. So we know it's responses per minute, so we will just double click um, this label here and type in responses per minute, again in all caps. Sometimes the font shifts on you and you just gotta have to pull it back here. And we'll double click our secondary y-axis and change this to percentage of item engagement. And we will pull this down until it all fits on one line. All right. So uh, again, we can make sure everything's centered appropriately. So if we click uh, our two different axis labels and then click our middle panel, we can go up to align and we can align these in the middle. That way it's perfectly aligned. We don't have to eyeball it. So now what we can do is add our uh, phase labels. So let's click the text box, type in here, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and type in baseline here, and then I'll show you if you don't have the model graph to look at where you can uh, get this information from. So 
Uh, oftentimes, Prism makes any new text bold, and so you'll just want to turn bolding off there. And it looks like size 20 looks appropriate. And I'm just going to hit Control C and Control V again to paste. So if you don't know the exact phase labels um, and you're basing this off of some of the other files, what you can do is go to your session log and you can see what the condition name is. So we have baseline and competing items for the first and second phases respectively. Another trick for aligning um, these according to the phase is sometimes I take this draw feature and draw a line according to the uh, width of the phase. And then I click the line in the text and align it center. And then I delete the line just to make sure that it's centered within the phase. So I'm just going to do the same thing here. You can also right click and go to align objects um, if you don't want to use the drop down menu. And we'll delete that again. Alright, so the last thing that we have to do is add in uh, clinic, home, and school, or the different uh, labels for the panels. So uh, I'm going to just click on our uh, phase label here and hit Control C and Control V. Scoot this down. And you can see it's underlined here, so I'm going to underline this. And I'm just going to change this to clinic. Control C, Control V. Home. Again, copy and paste. School. And what you can do is you can uh, hold down your control button and click each of these. And then either go up to the top or right click, align objects to the left or right, whichever works for you. And so if for some reason you didn't know what these labels should be, you could either look at um, the labels for your data tables or your graphs, or if you're using some of our other files for the video model, you can look at your session log or the folder for the data uh, files and see what um, the setting is. So we have graph panel one is clinic, home, school, etc. The other thing that we need the uh, session log for is to figure out where to put um, this information that the child is sick. And so we can look at our model graph to figure out where this is, but if you're using some of the other files, on one of the um, graph panel uh, tabs for the session log, you should see a comment, and that's to help you figure out where to put uh, the arrow legend and the text. And so we can see for session five of the third panel school, this little down point here, the kid was sick. So what we can do is click the text box, type in sick. Again, this makes it bold, so we're going to take that off. And it looks like maybe it's a little smaller than our uh, panel label, so we'll decrease that size maybe to about size 18 and scoot this down. And we just need to add in the arrow. So we'll click the drop down button, select arrow, and we'll draw in our arrow and just make sure that it's pointing to the correct uh, session. All right, so it looks like we've created our graph um, identically to the one that's on the screen over there. So what you'll just want to make sure is that you have all the different labels on here. So you've labeled your axes, you have your x-axis label, uh, tick marks, you have your uh, tick marks for your secondary and primary axes, you've inserted your uh, multiple baseline lines, and you have the phase and panel labels. 
So if you're all done, you can export your graph. You can click File, Export, and you can export to lots of different popular options. I tend to export either as enhanced meta file, um, though those files don't show up well on a Mac computer, or a PDF, as well as uh, Java recommends these EPS files for high resolution output. So you could select that there, um, type in your file name, click OK, and it'll export the graph to that different version. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.